Bermuda Triangle. It's known for swallowing over 2,000 ships and 200 aircraft over the centuries. 1272, switching good day, Envoy 3412. 13,000, uh, power discretion, uh, 3023, Envoy 3412. Subscription at 13,000, 3025, and 3042. On December 4th, 1970, Bruce Gernon took off in his Beechcraft Bonanza. On board, Bruce had two passengers, his father and business partner. They took off from Andros Island in the Bahamas and headed northwest for the Florida coast. This was a very typical flight for Bruce, as he had made this trip a dozen times. On average, it took him about an hour and a half from Andros to Miami. Bruce took off and started gaining altitude. At around 1,000 feet, Bruce noticed this weird black cloud, and it seemed to be growing. Bruce didn't have a choice. He flew into the black cloud. And he came out the other end just fine. At 11,000 feet, Bruce noticed another very strange cloud. It was massive. Bruce had no choice but to fly into this strange cloud too as well. At that moment, it became dark as night around the aircraft. There was no light coming through. But this wasn't a storm cloud, and it was not raining. All of a sudden, Bruce saw a flash of light. It would appear and vanish, just like lightning, but this wasn't lightning. The flashes were so bright, it lit up everything around the plane. Bruce continued to fly his plane for another 30 minutes when he realized this was the same cloud he had flown through the first time. But now it was in the shape of a tornado. He was almost flying through the center of it. Bruce said it was about a mile wide, and it seemed to be endless. About a minute later, Bruce saw light at the end of the tunnel. Bruce kept the yoke straight ahead. He was almost out of this nightmare. But just then, unexplainable things started happening. The opening of the tunnel started closing in on itself. The navigational instruments on the plane started going nuts. The compass was spinning by itself, counterclockwise. It was like the plane was being operated by something else. Right before the tunnel closed on itself, Bruce was able to break free of this weird fog. Bruce would later say, after he came out of the storm, for about 5 or 10 seconds his plane seemed to be weightless. The clouds dispersed, and Bruce was now in this weird grayish haze. After letting out a sigh of relief, Bruce contacted ground control, and he wanted them to determine his location. November 9815, go ahead. Ground control was confused. Bruce's plane was not showing up on radar. 9815, let me say last known position. It's almost like he was invisible. A moment later, ground control contacted Bruce and let him know he was showing up on radar now. He was actually in Miami airspace. Bruce was shocked by this information. It couldn't be true. The distance the beach craft was supposed to cover was about 250 miles. Remember, the whole trip generally took about 90 minutes, assuming there was no hiccup but this time, it only took 47 minutes. This model of aircraft can only cruise about 180 miles per hour. When you do the math, 
you realize this is physically impossible. Bruce thought the dispatcher must be mistaken. But after the clouds cleared, Bruce realized he was over Miami airspace. After landing the plane, Bruce thought, I gotta solve this mystery. There's no way we got here in this time. After landing, Bruce checked the remaining fuel along with his watch. The plane had not gone through the amount of fuel required for this trip. Bruce had the records pulled from Andros Tower along with the records from Miami International. Again, the time does not add up. It is physically impossible to make this trip in the amount of time he did it. All the evidence in hand seemed to indicate that Bruce's plane just skipped over almost half of the entire trip. Looking for answers, Bruce took all the evidence to experts and scientists trying to find an answer. No one was able to give Bruce an answer to what happened that day. It's almost like Bruce was able to jump space and time. What really happened on December 4th, 1970? It looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that, that shocked me. They don't make people that, that big. The way it moved. Uh, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. My name is Maximus Decimus Meridius, commander of the armies of the North, general of the Felix Legions, and you are listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. So many weird mysteries to our planet, to our world, that a lot of people don't look into and kind of look the other way. Um, I always, I'm fascinated when I hear scientists go, well, you know, time travel is possible. And then you kind of look at their working theories and you're like, yeah, that I can go with that. Uh, but if they just look back 50 years, we have a guy that, along with passengers and other eyewitnesses that seem to uh, jump space and time. To this day, no one can explain what happened to Bruce when he made that trip. And it's fascinating because we know uh, when, where, and what. We just don't know how he did it. We know where he took off from. We know what time he took off. Uh, we know where he landed. And we know what time he landed. And we also have the specs of the aircraft he was flying. So we know the capabilities of the aircraft he was flying. And nothing makes sense. And it wasn't just Bruce. Like I said in the, the intro, uh, you know, there was other eyewitnesses on the plane that were there. And again, to this day, no one can explain what happened to Bruce and how he was able to make that trip. Uh, what's fascinating is he took all of his evidence to scientists and, and experts, and he, he spent many years trying to find answers, and no one could give him an answer. And Bruce kind of came up with a theory. I think he called it uh, electric fog. He wrote a book about it. It's been years since I've read the book. A great book, by the way. Um, and it, it, so no one can really explain what happened to him. Uh, I've always had the wormhole theory. 
Um, yeah, but I've always assumed wormholes were something in space, but that's not necessarily true if the conditions are right. Um, well, I won't bore you guys with that. I hope I inspire you guys to go look at some of these other mysteries. Um, you know, I, and I get a lot of crap when I don't just talk about Bigfoot and I get it. You know, I've devoted fans that really want to hear about Bigfoot, but, uh, you know, when you start looking at some of these other mysteries, something completely irrelevant to your subject matter, like Sasquatch, um, you'll start to find weird answers to what your a uh, question you might've had. I'm not saying Bruce Gernan's story is related to Sasquatch. I'm just saying in general, when you start to look at these other strange mysteries, it's not hard to accept uh, when an eyewitness comes forward and goes, hey, I saw this. Uh, I mean, how do you explain time travel? Um, anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed that. And again, I hope I inspire you guys to go and kind of research, investigate some of these other mysteries. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Uh, I'll be back on Sunday for the members. Tonight, we're going to be chatting with John. And John comes to us from East Texas. Uh, and he had a lot of weird things happen to him on this property. But I'll let John kind of go into that. Uh, let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, John to the show. John, thanks for coming on. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me, Wes. Yeah, I appreciate you being here, John. And I know a lot of weird things happen to you on this property. Um, if you would, would you just kind of start from the beginning? I know the the very first encounter, uh, which is the the one I really wanted to talk to you about, was regarding the light. This is back 2014, 2015. Uh, if you would, would you just start from the very beginning? Kind of tell us what you were doing and, and what happened. So me and my uncle were, we were coyote hunting. Uh, we'd ha recently had a couple of calves killed, so we were trying to call the coyotes. And so we're sitting in the back of his truck in this pasture call blasting. And, you know, we're just kind of shooting the crap, not not really paying a whole lot of attention. And I happened to notice over his shoulder in the sky is this orange ball of light. And it was, it was like not over the tree line. It was off in the sky. Uh, it was, it was huge, probably about quarter the size of the moon would have been. And it's just kind of floating around. And so, you know, I pointed out to him and he, you know, he looks over and says, yeah, I see that too. And so, we're watching it, and it's kind of floating around, and then we we hear this this hum, kind of like an electric motor, and it's really really loud. And so we're we're sitting there looking at each other, bewildered, because we're in the middle of about five thousand acres of nothing. I mean, it's pasture land. There's not even oil wells, which is really weird for Texas. I mean, there's nothing. And so, you know, we're we're looking at each other kind of bewildered. And then we hear crashing through the forest. And we look over and this deer comes stumbling out of the forest like it's drunk and gets about 15 foot from our truck and just lays over. So, you know, that was that was odd. We get out of the truck. To go see what it, what was wrong with this deer, and I set one foot on the ground. Deer stands up and hauls ass like nothing was wrong with it. Yeah, that's strange. Kind of bizarre behavior. Yeah, that's that is extremely bizarre. I mean, I've I've been around hunting and stuff all my life, and I've never seen a deer act like that. And so we get, I get back up in the truck, and you know we're we're kind of. We're kind of spooky at this point, you know. This is this is odd, and I just happened to look back up, and the lights still in the sky, kind of floating around. Well, I happened to notice that there's about four or five jets flying towards this ball of light coming from the nearest Air Force base, and then I look over, and there's four more coming from another direction and then four more from another direction. 
all in total, I think we counted like 21 jets converging on this ball of light. And so we're watching this happen and we're, we're freaked out. And then all of a sudden, everything goes quiet. I'm talking horror movie silent. I mean, no, no wind, no birds, no bugs, nothing. And then we see little, little flashes of light near this ball. And then it just disappears. Like it just blinked out of existence. And so we're, we're kind of staring off in the sky, just absolutely bum fuzzled. And then we hear this crashing in the forest. It's like somebody is grabbing a hold of green trees and just twisting them off at the base and throwing them on the ground. Snap, crash, snap, crash. And it's progressively getting closer to the wood line, at which point me and my uncle decided we no longer needed to be in the area, and we hauled ass. And so... I'm driving down down the the road, talking to my uncle. We were in two different vehicles. In front of me is this bright blue streak of light that just it it was hauling ass. It just across the sky in a quarter of a second, and it's gone. And that's that's the craziest one of the craziest things that I've ever experienced in my life yeah that's weird about the light you know you saw the light twice how far up do you think that orange one was that you saw well i mean i really you know it's very hard to estimate distance in the sky but given that the the planes were just you know all you could see was their tail lights it would have to have been you know cruising altitude or lower so, you know, 20, 30,000 feet. Yeah, that, that's odd. A lot of people see the lights, man. A lot of people see the lights. Oh, that's yeah. Kind of- and that's, that's, I've seen the lights several times out there on that property. Uh, there was one time where we just went out there and there was just this blue ball of light hovering over the, the tree line and then it disappeared. Yeah, that's bizarre, John. You know, Texas is kind of known for the lights. You guys have the Marfa lights uh, down south, and then uh, you have the, uh, what is it, uh, Bragg Road, where the they call them ghost lights, uh, where people regularly see these lights flying around. Um, but it's not only in Texas. I mean, it's all over the world people are seeing these lights, and uh, it's just strange. Um, tell me about the incident on the property where you thought there was poachers on the property. Okay, and this this one is I'm not, I'm not easy to to scare, but I was absolutely terrified. Um, so me, my uncle, and uh, his two oldest kids were camping, and we were probably about two hundred yards away from where we were sitting in the truck that that first night, and this was probably about six months later. So we're just out there, you know, screwing off, just shooting guns and just playing around, you know, kind of decompressing and whatnot. We're sitting out there and, you know, not doing much or nothing until dark when we was going to spotlight for hogs because the hogs have been rooting up the pasture. Well, so we're we're sitting at the top of the of a hill. And at the bottom of this hill is a – so the way this, this sits is it's at the top of a hill, and then it's an alley between two tree lines. It's probably about 50 yards wide. And so at the bottom of this hill, there's a pasture that goes off to the left, and then there's a trail that goes off to the right. So it's it's dark. And I'm looking down towards this trail because hogs like to come out of that trail. And I can see what looks like somebody with a flashlight. And they the light pans up like you, you can see the path of the light like you would pan your flashlight up. 
there should have been nobody else on the property. You know, it, it, this is 300 acres of family land. There should have been nobody else out there. So I pointed out to my uncle. And so we're watching this happen, and the light pans three or four times. I notice these black shadows, four or five of them, just haul ass across this pasture. I mean, there's absolutely inhuman speed. And so I'm like, you know, what the hell is this? Pardon my language. Um, so at this point, we're all a little little spooked. And then I, I don't say anything about the shadows. We're just watching this, this light. So we decide that we need to confront this poacher. So we holler and we holler at him, tell him that he needs to leave the property and that we're armed and this and that. And about this time, a storm starts rolling through. So we're, you know, we're sitting there trying to figure out, is this a person down there? You know, do we need to go down there? Do we need to just leave the situation alone? And so eventually we don't see this light anymore. So we decide that the poacher has moved on. So... We walk back over to the tent where, where we eat supper, and it starts to rain. You know, we crawl in the tent. We're just in there, you know, shooting, having a good old time. When I hear outside of our tent what is very clearly bipedal footsteps in the grass, and, you know, you can tell the difference between a quadruped and a biped when they're walking. It's very clear. And so I alert my uncle and my cousins that there's somebody outside the tent. You know, it's a person. We sit back to back, and I've got a, a 44 revolver and a 10 millimeter 1911 in my hands. And I'm whatever is in front of the tent is about to have a very bad night. And my uncle has his shotgun loaded with slugs, and then we've got a 270 and a 308, you know, something is about to have a bad night. You know, we, about the time we announce that we are armed and whatever is outside the tent uh, needs to vacate the premises, lightning strikes in the wood line on the other side of the pasture. And you, it illuminates this figure that is standing outside of our tent. And... This thing is massive. I mean, it's it's hard to get a, a, a good read on size from a shadow cast on a tent. But given how close it would have had to have been to the tent for us to hear it walking like that, it was probably, you know, seven and a half, eight foot tall. And its arms came down to its knees. And I've never seen a man with arms that long. I am about to let this thing have it when it just kind of runs away you know you can hear it running so we're sitting there for a few minutes because we want to give whatever this time this thing is time enough to vacate the premises and we leave the tent get in the truck and go up to the farmhouse and that's where we spend that night we just left all of our camp and stuff and food and stuff out there the only things we took with us was our weapons and we left it there and went back and got it the next morning. Everything was still there, undisturbed. Soggy, but undisturbed. Let me ask you, John, what, what did you think it was looking out of your tent and seeing this this outline of a shadow, man-like figure? Well, I mean, the only thing it could have been would, was a Bigfoot. I mean, that was that was my first thought was, oh, shit, that's Bigfoot, <laughs> you know? Yeah, can I ask you, John, when you saw the earlier in the, the night, when you saw the four shadows running, were they upright like humans running or was it? Oh, yeah, like it was it was just like somebody, some dude was sprinting across the field in a black uh, ninja suit. I can't remember what those things are called, the body suits. Spooky. You know, generally poachers are there. It's a one man army. They, they generally don't run around in groups because they don't want to get caught. And most poachers won't hunt private land. They want to go to the national forest because they don't want to get caught. Obviously, it wasn't a poacher, uh, especially based on your description. I'm sure the lightning didn't help. You know, the lightning hits and 
uh, there's this weird figure standing there. Um, spooky man, I would have left too. I, I absolutely would have left. And, but I know there's so many weird things that happened on this property. Before we went on the air, uh, you were telling me your your uncle was, he ran into something and he called it a devil monkey, which is fascinating because I, I mainly hear that down south. Would you mind telling us that encounter? What kind of what your uncle told you? Okay, so he he calls me one morning and he's kind of he's kind of panicky, and he says, uh, "I want you to look up this this dog that I can't remember off the top of my head, but a real big fluffy looking dog." And he says, "So we're driving down this this road. It's it's just a, a white gravel oil field road. I mean, it's there's no." It's just access roads to, you know, several thousand acres of nothing. And he says, this thing just charged my truck this morning. I said, hey, what do you mean it charged your truck? And he said, there was this, this creature that just charged my truck out of the woods this morning on my way to drop my son off at school. And I said, well, you know, describe it to me. And he, he said it was, it looked kind of like that dog, except for it had a long, fluffy tail, and you couldn't, you couldn't see its face. Like, the, the face was not registering with its eyes. I, I know a lot about all this, this kind of weird stuff, because I have no life, and, uh, so I kind of went through in my head what kind of things it could be. And so I sent him a, a drawing of what uh, some people say the devil monkey looks like. And he goes, oh, that was it. That was what just charged my truck. Did he go into more details with you, John, as far as what he saw beyond, beyond what you just said? I mean, did he give you any more details? He said it, had a, it was a, a four-legged about six foot tall black and brown thing was all he could he could figure out to describe it that looked vaguely like some kind of dog that I can't for the life of me remember what it was he said. I'm assuming he didn't stop. Did he just kind of keep going? Oh yeah, he he never stopped. Yeah, it's strange, John. You know, and a lot of people, when I talk with them about encounters on their property with Sasquatch, a lot of times they'll talk about other weird things on their property. And not just down in Texas, but I mean, all over in the United States and even up in Canada. And I mean, weird stuff, stuff most people haven't even heard on the show. And a lot of times when I hear it, I always think, God, is that is that land cursed or what in the world's going on out there? This This property... I can go into a lot of the weirdness that's went on on this property if you'd like me to. Yeah, I'd like to get into it, John. You know, one of the things I love about Texas is there is areas that are very green and lush like East Texas, but uh, it's all pine trees. And so if something gets up and takes off running, you got a good chance you're probably going to see it. Um, If you would, yeah, tell us what else happened on this property. Uh, one of the things that I found out this morning was apparently there was a a black dog on the property uh, that was attacking some of their dogs. So, you know, they kind of figured it was just a stray dog, so they was just going to shoot it and be done with it. Well, so they shot it with a seven wind mag in the head, and they drug off the carcass, and the next day the dog was in the yard again. And so they shot it again with several 12-gauge slugs, hauled off the carcass. The next day, it was back in the yard. And they shot it three or four more times before it finally stopped showing back up. Yeah, I did a show on this. The first time I heard about this was actually from soldiers who went over to Iraq and Afghanistan. They would talk about these, these black dogs. But this is your uncle telling you about what he saw on the property, correct? My uncle, my great uncle, my uh, cousin, you know, several, several people saw this, this thing and shot it. Did they ever describe the dog? I mean, I realize it's a black dog, but I mean, did they ever go into any sort of details about 
what they were seeing and what they were shooting. It, obviously, it wasn't a, a normal dog. There was something else going on there. But did they ever describe it beyond just a black dog? It was just a big, black, shaggy dog with jagged teeth was all they would. That was the best descriptor I could get. Yeah, talk about confusion. I mean, having this thing show up and, you know, you shot it and killed it. And here it is again the next day. Strange. Well, I mean, I don't know if you you have hunted much, but uh, a seven mag, you know, that's not something that something just stands up from. Yeah, we mainly use a 30 out six up here in the Pacific Northwest just because there's not um, uh, there's things in the way. There's mountains, there's trees, there's things in the way. Uh, some people use seven, seven mm. Uh, that would be something that, you know, you would hunt with probably more down in Texas because there's more range you're shooting at, but yeah, seven mm is no joke. It'll blow a hole in something. Yeah, that'll, yeah, it's, and for it to just kind of shrug that off, that's not natural. And they, they say that they said that it would sleep at the foot of one specific gravestone in an old cemetery right down the road. Yeah, I can't remember what episode it was. I interviewed a soldier who was who had come back from Iraq, and he was talking about uh, the black dogs, uh, and he had a few run-ins with them, and he would ask the locals what they were, uh, and they would tell him that it was a genie, you know, our version of a demon, basically, and I thought that would be the last time I ever heard about it. After I aired the show, I had a lot of soldiers come forward who had run into this weird black dog. A lot of high-ranking soldiers, actually. Um, and now, even off the air, I'll ask soldiers, hey, have you ever run into the black dog? And, I, and I'll probably say over half of them have seen it. Uh, they'll describe it different ways. You know, glowing red eyes uh, seem to appear and disappear. It's strange. You, we don't really have that go on here as much, but I've definitely heard it. it seems to be more of a Middle East thing, more of a, a gin or genie. Uh, it does happen here, though. Has there been anything else that has happened on that property? So we got a photo of an anomalous black cat on a trail cam. It's just a, a black cat sprinting through the woods, which is not something that we're supposed to have here in Texas. I've heard lots of accounts of people saying, you know, we got black panthers, but the government swears up and down they don't exist. Uh, we found one of our uh, deer stands that's been been set up for years and years and years. We found it one day, scratched all to hell and back. Just big long gashes carved in the plywood, which may or not may or may not be related to the cat. Uh, my uncle says that he and a bunch of friends were just driving around in the back pasture. Ironically enough, the same exact pasture where we had that first encounter. And this was probably 10 years, 10, 15 years before we had our that encounter. He said there was a, a he called it a banshee, but it was a white glowing woman standing on a fence post in his pasture. And, of course, you know, they didn't stick around to, to get a good look at it. And then also, uh, come to find out, they have sighted a uh, large quadrupedal uh, animal walking across the pasture. Said it was about six foot at the shoulder, which you know it's it's not a cow because you can you can see a you know you, you can tell it's a cow or not you know, and it, hogs just don't get that tall. Yeah, and those boys down in Texas, they they know hogs and, and cows. They see them all the time. Did they ever describe it any more than just kind of a large animal? I mean, that's a really large animal, six feet across. No, they, they didn't get get very good look at it. They they just saw a, a large animal crossing a pasture. And it's this is pretty tall grass, so it's hard to get a, a good look at things anyway. And they also saw... Uh, which is, you know, kind of strangest to me, which I have my theories on what it is, but I don't, I don't, uh, I don't call this particular creature by name because I believe that draws them to you. Uh, an upright 
deer that was very emaciated. And I'll let you draw your own conclusions on that one. I'm assuming you're talking about skinwalkers. Yeah, which I just, I'm very superstitious about those in a, a certain cannibalistic Native American spirit. Uh, that I just, I don't say their names out loud. Yeah, it seems to be some sort of powerful demon. Uh, it kind of goes back to what I was saying in the intro. Sometimes when you look into other weird uh, mysteries or encounters, you'll find answers. And it, going back to what you were just saying, the first time I heard that, uh, I can't remember what show it was. I had this truck driver on the show, and he, I asked him, this guy drives all over the United States, and I had asked him, What's the weirdest thing you saw? What's the weirdest thing you've ever seen, you know, driving around uh, as much as you drive? And he said, one time I was coming down this hill and there he thought it was a deer off to the side of the road. And as he's coming up on it, his lights are starting to light it up. And he's like, oh, it's a deer. The closer he got to it, he said from the waist up, it was a woman. And he really slowed down because he thought he was losing his mind. And as he slowed down, they made eye contact. She turned and looked at him. And he told me she was very beautiful. She had solid black eyes, but she was very beautiful. And the bottom half of her seemed to be a deer. And I asked him, I said, was it like a ghost? And he said, no, it wasn't. He said she was very solid, just walking along the road. Uh, and it, he immediately had that overwhelming sense of fear after they made eye contact. And uh, I didn't really think much more of it. I believe the guy. I just didn't know what he'd run into. And probably the next day or two, uh, the Native Americans around the U.S. almost crashed my email server. Uh, they were all emailing me and explaining to me this dear woman and how she's in their culture. And she lures men away to kill them or leads them to their death. I don't know that a demon can kill you, but uh, leads them off to their death. And basically what I got from it is it seems to be some weird demon. Yeah. And uh, these these... These things are very evil. I mean, just evil in nature, and yeah, it's it's kind of kind of uh, a little sketchy, you know, hearing that they've seen one on their property, which I mean makes sense because there's a Native American burial ground right across the street from the property, and uh, and I have no idea if he actually encountered this or not. But one of my other cousins asked me about the staircases in the woods. Have you heard of those? Yeah, I have heard about that. I actually had a uh, fishing game officer contact me and he asked me if I'd ever seen or heard anything about these weird staircases in the woods. And I hadn't, I had never heard of such a thing. And he was telling me about different ones he's come across. So I, I started looking into it and it's very strange. I think part of it can be explained, um, but there is a portion of it that, that's very weird. Uh, but, but tell me about it. So we was, I was out there the other day hanging out with my, my uncle and my cousins. And he, he goes, so what's this thing about the staircases in the woods, which was very odd for him to bring up. Cause that's a very, very niche thing. Not a lot of people have heard of this. And so I said, you know, if, if, if you find one, just turn around and run in the opposite direction, you know, go back the way you came and, and forget about it. And so I don't know if he actually encountered that, but it was odd for him to ask that question. Cause you know, that's very, very niche. Well, I think a lot of the staircases can be explained um, because, you know, a lot of those old homesteads, um, they will, uh, there's two things that are left over uh, over time after time destroys something. Uh, one is a fireplace and the other one's a staircase. However, yeah. having said that, uh, these DNR officers sent me pictures of, I, I don't know, man. Uh, and they're just immaculate staircases just in the middle of the woods. It's exactly what it was. Uh, it was something I'd never seen before. I'd never seen these. It, it was like the Queen of England came down and like created a staircase uh -huh. in the middle of the woods. And, and you, you, you can tell when you're in an old homestead. I don't know if you've ever been in them, yeah. but you, you can, you can see other remnants. You know, stobs of studs sticking out of the ground, or you know, stuff laying on the ground around it. So if it was just an old homestead. You know, I'd be like, oh, well, you know, it's just an old homestead, you know. But 
if you just come across a random immaculate set of stairs in the woods, run like hell in the other direction. <laughs> yeah, that might be good advice. I, I don't know enough about it to really speak intelligently. Like I said, I, th- I think a lot of them can be explained. I think a lot of them can be explained away as, uh, you know, it's a staircase, but the rest of the house is gone. But there is those ones. I've had some weird pictures sent to me, that's for sure. Uh, I wanted to ask you, John, before we went on the air, you were kind of telling me about uh, some of the very strange paranormal things that have happened to you. What was kind of the first incident? I'll start with the lights. I'm driving down the road, headed home one day from work, and my uncle calls. And he says, Jonathan, I don't know what's going on. And this is the same uncle. Uh, But there are some lights hovering over your house. Are you are you home? I said no, but my sister, uh, she, my sister's home alone. I step on the gas and I'm traveling ninety down a foreign market road, which was not very bright, but I did it anyway. And so I get home, everything's fine. I go talk to my sister, everything's fine. I, you know, by the time I get home, my uncle comes walking out of the woods. And so, you know, I walk over there and we talk and he said, man, there were some some lights hovering over your over what looked like the house. And I said, well, you know, let's let's walk back here, you know, to the back and see if we can see anything. And so we get back to where we had a a storage yard for oil field equipment, you know, pipe and and motors and pumping jacks that we sold. And the air just felt heavy i don't know how else to describe it oppressive and i just so happened to look down and in the dust and rock is a series of concentric circles that was that was very very odd now when Um, you when you say that what do you mean i mean it's just a small circle and then another couple inches a bigger circle just carved in the dust and rock and it's probably he it got to about fifty foot when they stopped. And then uh, my first ever encounter with the not natural was at my grandmother's house, and uh, I'm laying in bed reading a book, and this was one of those old timey real heavy brass frame beds and so i'm si- i'm laying in this bed and there's one of these little 19 inch rabbit ear tvs from the early days of color television and so i'm sitting there and i, I feel the bed move and i'm probably about nine years old at this point and i feel the bed move which is odd because i couldn't have shifted that bed if i tried and i look up and the bed is suddenly hovering about half, like the the footboard of the bed is about halfway up on the TV when it should have been level with the bottom. And so, you know, I kind of cock my head and I'm trying to figure out what's going on. And this bed violently shakes left and right and then slams on the ground. And so, obviously, I freak out. I jump off the bed, run out in the hallway, just screaming my head off. My grandmother, you know, what's wrong with you? Why are you screaming? Yada, yada, yada. And I said, well, the bed just picked up off the ground and shook. And, you know, she obviously didn't believe me, but just go back to bed. You were you were dreaming, you know, whatever. I go go to get back in the bed, and I notice that... In this carpet, you know how if you set furniture on carpet for for long periods of time, it'll leave a divot in the carpet. Well, the bed was shifted out of its divots. So obviously the bed had been moved. I mean, and like I said, I couldn't have moved the bed if I tried with all my might. You know, John, the, the older I get, the more, the more I realize uh, we really are apes. I mean, we really are primates. Um, it, there's so many unseen things that go on in this world that a lot of people will just pass off, you know, and, and science seems to pass a lot of things off. That's why I like the Bruce, uh, Gernon story that I did in the beginning, cause science can't explain it. And there's a ton of evidence, 
uh, to support what happened, yet no one has an answer. Um, even demonic possession. You know, I've asked scientists in the past, explain demonic possession to me, and they can't because there is no explanation. Um, I want to ask you, was there other things going on in the house? If if she did, she would have just pre pretended it didn't happen. And so now I'll move on to my demonic encounter. So I'm about 19 years old. So I'm laying in the bed one night, and I'm home alone. Uh, alarms on, doors are locked, windows are locked. Nobody's getting in the house. And so I sleep with a pistol by my bed, have for, for years just because there's no reason not to. And uh, sorry, this, is, this, is, this freaks me out still to this day. I feel I'm laying in bed. And I feel something watching me. My first instinct is somebody's broken into the house. I sit up in bed, grab my pistol off the nightstand, and crouched at the foot of my bed is, oh God, I'm getting chills. Um, if, you, if you Google the rake, the first image that pops up is what was crouched at the foot of my bed, except it was pitch black with cold red eyes just looking at me. And oh, I'm about to start. I'm about to start shooting when it just blinks out of existence. It just disappears doesn't fade away doesn't run off it just and gone i'm assuming this isn't your grandmother's home no this is this is a different property which yeah it's there's a whole bunch of crap that went on on that property too uh, you know we we heard uh footsteps upstairs and chairs would be would roll around and uh my youngest cousin saw an apparition of a man covered in blood in their kitchen. That's terrifying. With the, with regard to the rake, was that the only time you saw it? That's the only time I've saw it. I've, I've got all I can figure out is it was a demon crouched at the foot of my bed. Can I ask you, did the uh, expression change on the entity's face? And you mentioned red eyes, red glowing eyes. So they, they were actually glowing? Yes, the eyes were glowing like embers like coals out of a fire and it had this this grin on its face and I, all i can describe of it it looked like the cheshire cat if the cheshire cat had shark teeth yeah that creepy smile um i've heard it many times a lot of people describe it like you did john the alice in wonderland cat you know that big smile uh, I've also had other eyewitnesses t say it reminded them of the Joker, like in Batman, how he has that big smile. I can see that. I can definitely see that. And and so about two weeks later, same situation. I'm home alone, doors locked, windows locked, alarms on. Whole, whole shooting match. Laid in bed by myself. Pistol on my nightstand. And to to preface this, the way my door was sat in the frame, it put pressure on the 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 doorknob. So when you opened it, it clicked very, very, very loudly. It would echo through the whole house. And so I'm laying in bed and I'm a I'm an insomniac, so I was just laying there trying to go to sleep. And I hear my door click. So, of course, grab my pistol, and I'm about ready to shoot whoever has broken into the house. And standing in my doorway is a, is the shadow figure. And it's just, uh, just the outline of a dude. Very tall, tall enough that the top of his head was obscured by the door frame. And I, I could tell he was wearing like a uh, a wide brim hat, like a, a top hat or something. 
there's just this dude standing in my door. I go to demand he identify himself. And then it was my whole world went dark, like somebody had just laid a cloth over my head. And then when I could see again, the door was shut and he was gone. And I'm still sat up in bed, pistol drawn, finger on the trigger, ready to shoot whoever was in my door. I've experienced sleep paralysis. I know what sleep paralysis feels like. This was not that. It scared this plus the demon at the foot of my bed scared me so bad. I bought a house and was and moved out in two weeks. Let me ask you, John, you know, I have this theory about I probably know more about Sasquatch than demons, which means I, I don't know very much. But um, I have this theory on demons that they have to be invited in. I don't think a demon can just show up. I think there has to be some sort of invite for them to. And it comes in many different forms. But what, why do you think that they were? at that house i mean did you look into the history of that house the thing is that, that house was a fresh build we built it so we uh my uncle was having issues in his house you know doors would be open keys would be moved and so he called in a one of his friends was a psychic and she shows up on the property and she goes, oh, some really effed up stuff happened on this property that I, I'm not going to get into. You know, this there's there's a, a vortex at the end of this house. My grandfather, who is a preacher, we we came out there and we we had a we essentially exercised the house to get it to leave, and it it did. It left their house and came to my house. Yeah, it's terrifying, man, especially, you know, if something shows up at the foot of your bed, I, I don't blame you for going to bed with a gun, but, you know, in this situation, what do you do? You can't really shoot it. I was going to try. <laughs> I mean, it, I was I was in the process of pulling the trigger when it vanished. It probably wouldn't have done no good, but, you know, I'm I'm going to go down swinging, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, ghost and demons, man. I, I, I'm not a fan of. <laughs> uh, I don't, you know. What do you do, really, in that situation? It's. Uh, I feel for you, man. There's so many weird things in this world that no one really has an answer for. I want to ask you about Sasquatch. You know, you've looked into it for a while, and I was curious. What do you think Sasquatch is? So, and, and be prepared for my hottest of hot takes here. I think there's more than one different kinds. So I think that the kind that we have here in the South, the, the wood booger gugweed type, you know, that are extremely violent. I think they're demons. And then you have the, the patty types that are just essentially gentle giants just walking through the woods are probably a relic hominid. And then I think when you get to the more the supernat more supernatural aspects like the the cloaking and the the vanishing and the things like that, I think that's when you get into the nephilim. It's definitely an interesting take on it, um, and I don't necessarily disagree with you. But why would there be you go from demonic to natural, or uh, we'll say natural animal to nephilim? What kind of made you come up with those different theories? Well, and, and I have a, a fourth one that is a little bit more hot take than the others. Um, I think that it's just, it's one of those where, you know, it, it's the relic hominid and then the Nephilim and then the demon finds a, a niche for itself in a big ass ape running through the woods beating the shit out of each other or uh, out of people. I mean, that's a pretty good niche for a demon to fill. So he decides, hey, that's what I'm going to be. And I also think that some of these that are the, the very weird ones, like it's the where it's just kind of almost like a, uh, a, a urban legend that people see all the time in the same spot. I think that's, have you ever heard of the concept of a tulpa? No, I don't think so. So a tulpa 
is a uh, a concept devised by Tibetan monks, where essentially human thought can give rise to to things. If enough people believe something, it comes into existence. I got you. So, you know, it, it that's that's the only I I can't come up with one unifying theory why you know we in the South have violent ones that will you know eat you as soon as look at you, and then you have ones like the Patterson Gimlin creature that just looks at them and then continues about their business, and then you also have ones that you know clearly have more supernatural abilities. You know, mind speak and cloaking and vanishing and walking through fences and crap. Let me ask you, um, you don't really hear of demons or Nephilim, you know, Nephilim's a whole different topic, but let's let's just go with demons. Um, uh, Pretending to be great apes or pretending to be chimpanzees why would a and i don't necessarily disagree with what you're saying but what my question is why would they present themselves in that form if it's a relic hominid or a natural animal we haven't caught up with well because and yeah that that's a that's a very good point and why why would the demon do half the things a demon would do it's part of their as a, a a demon part of their existence is to cast doubt on the the teachings of the Bible and I mean if you've got a a massive ape running around the woods that it doesn't talk about anywhere in the Bible that would cast doubt on it you know you know what I mean I'm, I'm not I'm not sure if I'm I'm making sense. Yeah, you are. You are making sense, and I'm not breaking your balls on this by any means. Um, no, I, you know I. I understand. I, I would. I like to be questioned on my theories. It makes me think them through. <laughs> yeah, it's just so strange. I mean, I I get what you're saying, and it, and it does make sense. I think, um, and there's nothing wrong with your answer because, despite what anyone says, no one knows what Sasquatch actually is. Um, and I get the Bible. You know, it it's. I'm not religious, but I've, I know it well. And I do know that most of the Bible is, um, when you're talking about demonic or the fallen or, you know, evil and good, um, the main theme with regard to evil, it seems to be deception. Um, and the rest of the Bible is basically bloodlines. Once you figure that out, the old Testament actually makes a lot of sense. It, it's a, it's a good take on what it could be. I mean, you could be right. One of the last questions I want to ask you is, um, have you ever gone back to that property where all of this kind of began with, with the strange encounters? Do you go back and go hunting? I, I go back to that property, but I do not, I do not spend time alone there and I'm definitely never unarmed. Yeah. It sounds like one of those properties you just kind of want to leave alone. You know, if you do go back, will you let me know if anything happens? I will sure keep you uh, appraised. And I really appreciate you coming on, John, taking the time to share what happened to you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you giving me a platform to do so, Wes. Thanks, John. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchronicles.com. If you get a chance, check out sasquatchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Until next time, everyone.